to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. On the podcast today is Elise Fabro, and Elise and I met while at USC. She was actually president of our sorority, Alpha Chi Omega, when I first joined. And Elise is an environmentalist to her core, but she's not your typical environmentalist. And she explains why on today's episode. And Elise is really following her passions. And within that, she's forging her own path. And I know that so many of us can relate to this, where you're creating your own version of a life or a career that really feels good to you and aligns with who you are and what you want to do, but it might look different than what's typical within that particular industry or different from what's really expected of you. And it was so interesting for me to hear Elise talk about and reflect on what it's been like learning how to be her own version of an environmentalist. And on today's episode, we chat all about the importance of learning to follow the things that you love, being honest about your limits, and making your passions really clear, both to yourself and to others. Because once you do, you'll really be surprised by the magic and the opportunities that start to show up for you. I have known Elise for seven years, and I learned so much more about her during today's conversation, and I'm excited to share her story and her journey with you on today's episode. As always, to learn more, visit the show notes section of our website, seekthejoypodcast.com slash show dash notes and everything is right there. Also, if you've been enjoying Seek the Joy podcast, make sure to subscribe and if you feel so inspired, leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. And if you do, send me a screenshot of your review to sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com and I will send you my brand new guide for infusing more joy into your life along with a couple of limited edition Seek the Joy podcast stickers. I was really searching for a way to say thank you for your love and support of this podcast and I can't wait to share these with you guys. All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and don't forget to join us back here on Thursday for the second episode in the Power of Storytelling series. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Elise. My name is Elise. I am a recent graduate with my JD MBA. So I did both a business and a law school degree. And I went to Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And my passion has really always been the environment. I'm definitely an environmentalist at my core. um, And that kind of sparked when I had an opportunity to see Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth speech live when I was in high school in about 2004 or 2005. And I remember watching the presentation and and thinking, wow, humans are having such a huge impact on the environment and I'm going to do something about that. And that's going to be my life mission. For me, it's, it's really kind of the, the overall impact I, and I'm kind of the overall heart behind the environmental movement. And, um, and so I'm not your typical environmentalist. And I tell just about everybody this, you're not going to find me camping on the weekends. Like I don't drink hemp milk. Like, um, (laughs) like, I'm like, and like, I'm not going to go camp out in a tree to save it. Like, you know, and I totally respect those people who do that, but it, that's just not me. Gretchen Rubin has, if you've read any of her books, she has these kind of, um, in her book better than before she talks about being really true to herself. And, you know, sometimes we have these grand visions of ourselves where, um, you know, we're like, Oh, I, I need to be like that person, but it's just not true to your core. And so for me, like I'm an environmentalist at my core, but I'm not like your typical environmentalist. And so I've really tried to figure kind of like a different way to be an environmentalist. And so what I've been really following is for these past, you know, in 12, 13 years, how to be my version of an environmentalist and how to have that positive impact on the environment in my way. And so in high school, I started like the environmental club in college. I actually, I never changed my major. I was always an environmental studies and political science major where I really learned about all the problems. And then when I kind of started to get toward the end of my BA, I was like, you know, we've, I went to some of my professors and I was like, Hey, we've talked about all these problems, but we haven't really started in on any of the solutions. And like, that's really what I'm here for. 
And they were like, yeah, that's nice. Um, you have to get a master's to do that. And I was like, okay, well, like, let's, let's do that. And at that time, I, I was kind of interested in getting information out to the people about environmental impact. I was like, look, we're a democracy. I can't make people do anything. But I do think that if I give them all of the right information, they'll, make, they'll be able to make a more environmentally sound decision. And so I was like, okay, like I'm going to have this kind of impact through several different ways. Either, um, And I really saw it all in law, environmental litigation, environmental legislation, or corporate law with a focus in kind of like green companies. And so I strategically went through each of those. And I ended up taking a federal income tax class. And I just like, I absolutely fell in love. And I was like, this is how I'm going to have an impact, you know, corporations. And it ended up kind of going into kind of finance too, because around that same time that I decided to do corporation stuff, I was part of the, I got to go to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP21 in Paris. The section I focused on in the agreement was the finance section. And of course, private equity is very finance focused and project finance focused. And I just thought, oh my gosh, moving money to the right places and to the right project, that's how I'm going to have an impact. And so that's what I've really been chasing ever since. Wow. Okay. I have literally so many questions, but what do you feel you've learned the most about yourself going through all of that? I learned to follow the things I love. And my dad has a great thing where he always says, like, keep your eye on the prize, you know, keep your eye on the bead. And for me, going through, you know, I feel like I learned that, you know, I want to have that impact. And in order to have that impact, sometimes I have to do things that aren't so easy. Mm -hmm. I learned that sometimes you have to have a little pain in order to get the gain. If you want to advance forward, you have to put in that kind of time. And I think I learned the patience of putting in that time and kind of putting in that energy so that you lay a great foundation so that you can have what you want in the future and having Mm -hmm. that patience with yourself and continuously every single day, putting in just a little bit of work. And I think also something that I learned that slow and steady wins the race. Like life is not a sprint. Life is a marathon. And so I learned to really slow down and just take step tiny steps at a time because I'm not a sprinter, I'm a marathon runner. And that I, tr- I feel like for a long time, I was trying to live my life in sprints, and I was just like burning myself out. And so learning to take stuff much more slowly, and that means having much more like foresight and taking my time with things, um, and giving myself the time, like budgeting in the time for stuff to take a long time. I think that that was, that was probably something I, I really have learned throughout this whole process. And it took me a long time to learn it, Um, But now that I have, I feel like I live a lot happier of a life. I love what you said just about slow and steady. And yeah, once you start to run those sprints, you really start to to wear yourself out. Oh, absolutely. So like for me, 2016 was really the year of saying no. I used to be like a a person who would say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And... It, because genuinely, because I wanted to do everything. And I was at, I was at some alumni event for my high school and our former head ma- headmistress said, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And I feel like she was quoting somebody. So I don't, I don't want to like hundred percent attribute the quote to her, but I think it's a great quote in that. Like I would say to myself, of course I can do that. Of course I can do that. Like, sure. Just add it on. And, but the thing is, is that it's not just can I do one thing or like, you know, one thing in a vacuum? Sure. I can do anything in a vacuum, but together there's only 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week. And I felt like for so many years I was saying, Oh my gosh, I could really use two more days in a week or at least another day in the week. And to me, that was really a sign that I was saying yes to too many things. And so in 2016, I just started saying no to stuff. And that was really hard for me to do, but it made me kind of refocus on my priorities and what I love to do because before I didn't have problems saying no to things that I genuinely didn't want to do. That was fine. But it was the stuff where I was like, I like this, but doing a bunch of things that I just like are detracting from making the time to do the things that I love. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course we all have to do stuff that we don't like. Like I don't enjoy going to the gas station and filling my car up. And I don't enjoy (laughs) like, you know, I, I like, I don't enjoy having to pick dry cleaning up. Like but they're kind of like, you You have to do a certain amount of stuff just to like live life like a human. But other than that, I was like, I'm only going to do the stuff that I genuinely just love. And that's been a huge source of happiness for me. And, and being non-apologetic about it too. For a long time, I would say, I would feel bad about saying no to things. And so I learned to instead say, just flat out no, and not feel like I had to give a qualifier 
or explain myself in any way, but just saying, no, no, thank you. Thanks for the offer. And 100% being genuine. And I think also giving myself permission that no today doesn't mean no forever. Mm -hmm. So for example, I initially had um, at the like at the end of 2016, I had this like great vision that I was going to go hike the Swiss Alps in the summer oh of 2017. God. Yeah. But you have to be able to do some major hiking. Like it's a level three. And I was like, I'd love to do that. It'd be great to do right after the bar. And then I tried and I tried to make the time to put in the training. I needed to be able to hike no problem, like six to eight miles a day, which meant that I needed to have a training regimen of about at minimum walking six to eight miles a day. And for reference, I was walking maybe like two or three a day before then. Mm -hmm. But it was that I had to do take a certain number of classes, which was over the limit in order to complete my degree. And so I said, okay, you know what, this summer, it's not going to happen. But you know what, maybe in another summer, or maybe in two summers, it will happen. So saying no today doesn't mean I'm never going to go hike the Swiss Alps. It just means that the season that I'm in right now of life doesn't allow for it. And to yeah. me, that was really comforting because a lot of times I felt like if I was saying no to something, I was saying no to it forever. Um, and so kind of giving myself permission to say your season of life right now just like doesn't allow for it. And that, that kind of gave me a lot of freedom. I think that's so true. And I think we forget that just because we're saying no right now, that doesn't mean it's no forever. And I love what you said just about prioritizing and trying to find that balance. And in the year 2017, are you saying no just as much as you were in, in 2016? Yeah, I feel like it was, I feel like in 2016, I really created that habit in myself. Um, and so I find that I just live life better now. Mm -hmm. And I, I say no to things much more easily now. And yeah, I feel like it's definitely a habit that's endured. And I, every now and then I catch myself being like, I'm doing too many things or I'm doing things that I don't necessarily love. But I, I feel like because in 2016, I kind of set that hat up, habit up. I've, I have almost like a built-in check now and I realize yeah. it much sooner. Yeah, and so totally. I feel like I'm able to kind of check it a lot sooner than I was years ago. Yeah, you sort of, I think, start to build up that muscle. And yeah, you, exactly. over time, it becomes easier. And it's not just about saying no, it's about choosing the things that you want to prioritize and what's important to you in the moment. So yeah. today, how do you find that balance for yourself in your in your day to day life? So I, I would say I'm definitely really new to all of this. And so I'm really learning and being honest with myself about what my limits are. I, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I, I felt like I used to just assume that I was like superwoman, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of started to realize that I used to run at 110% capacity, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I feel like our society really encourages that. Oh, um, for sure. I certainly didn't sleep enough. I didn't eat enough or get the right nutrients. And I cert I still don't drink enough water. And, um, and I definitely didn't like exercise enough. And I, I realized like I, I was like not the only person out there who was doing this. But it was in, it was actually in business school when we were taking, I was taking uh, like an operations class and we were talking about like the throughput and the capacity of like a big machine. And there's a famous case about cranberries. And so they'd say, how many buckets of cranberries can we get through this machine? And in a portion of the case, they were like, and keep in mind that capacity for this throughput or, you know, whatever is, you know, let's say you could do 110 buckets an hour, but you can't actually run the machine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's going to have to be scheduled maintenance and stuff like that, um, where you have to have the machine down for a certain period of time. So don't build into your calculations, it running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and I, like, for some reason, that just like really clicked in my mind that just like kind of that I'm a very visual learner. And so I was like, well, of course you have to shut the machine down. <laughs> like you can't like, and, but I realized that I was treating myself like a machine. And in college, I was like known for having my days like blocked out by like 15 and 30 minute segments. I actually segments. remember that. <laughs> oh yeah. It was, it, that was like how I did all the crazy stuff. In, like I, I was a member of, I feel like everything in college. And yeah, so you did and everything. I, loved, I loved it. It was so much fun. And the only reason I could make it happen was because I was like so dedicated to like my 15 minute schedules. So, you know, when I was reading, um, there's a book called the reason why nice girls don't get the corner office. And I'm, I'm not done reading it yet. So I can't like 100% say like best book I've ever read. But they, there was a quote in there that said something along the lines of like, it's really important to run your body and your kind of life at like 90% capacity. Mm -hmm. And this was and I was literally reading this maybe like two weeks ago. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, this is so what I'm trying to 
shift my life to is to run at 90% capacity. And it's not because I'm not giving 100%, but it's that every now and then things happen where you necessarily have to kick it up to 100% or kick it up to 110%. And really, it's going to drain you, you know, whether it's something happens with family or friends or work or what, whatever it may be. But if you haven't built in that extra kind of like 10% wiggle room, then you're just you're going to like absolutely crash and burn at some point in time. And I feel like I've burned myself out multiple times at this point in my life trying to run at 110%. And so I'm really in the process of shifting to more of a like 90% capacity model, which makes me sound so mathematical and overly, <laughs> overly logical about my own life. But that that's like the kind of nutcase I am. So um, and so but I I found that that's helpful. And I feel like giving myself permission to not continuously hit my like best benchmark time on something has been very freeing. That's kind of how I've been learning to balance that is actually because I feel like inherent in when when I used to think of balance was doing every single thing perfectly and putting in just the perfect amount of time. Whereas instead, I find that for me, balance is like budgeting for 90% utilization, but in reality, kind of knowing that you're probably going to bump that up to 100% at a, like, you know, at some point in time and just being fine with that. I think giving yourself that downtime and that time to sort of, um, I guess, recharge your batteries too. Yeah, I think um, Because I think when you're going, going, going all the time and right now in sort of the society and the culture that we live in, you're sort of expected to do everything and you're mm-hmm. expected to do everything really, really well. And yeah. I think it's sort of an unforgiving environment right now. And it puts a lot of pressure on everyone to sort of dis- define, you know, success based upon how much you get done in a day and mm-hmm. how many hours you can bill in a week. And I think while all that might be great, you know, for some people, but you end up burning out. It takes a lot of like, it's a, it's, it's not something like you were saying with society, it's, you know, running at that 110% is something that society really encourages. And so you have to kind of start to swim against the current in a little bit to do it. And that's very hard. It's very hard to do that. um, Just because you have to make a conscious decision to be a different person. Um, When you know, in society, you kind of want to just go with the flow. And so yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I, I couldn't tell you at a certain point in time, like why I decided to kind of start flowing against the current a little bit, probably because I was like, this is the millionth time I've been burned out in my life. And I was like, I'm tired of this. I don't want to live my life like yeah. this anymore. No, I think you get to a place, right? Where it's just, it's, it's like enough. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's not working for you. You're waking up in the morning and you're so drained, even though you have, mm-hmm. you have to get up, you have to go to work, you have to be or you have to go to school, you have to be a functioning member of society. But but I'm going to rewind a little bit back to something we were talking about earlier, because I realized I, we didn't really touch Mm -hmm. too much on this about Mm -hmm. how you're not like the traditional environmentalist. Yeah, And that really reminded me of what we were just talking about now, figuring out what works for you and swimming in the direction that is right for you. And so it's about staying true to within what it is you're passionate about. And I I just remember now, you know, I just feel like those two things really go, they really go hand in hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really, I really, really agree with that. You went to COP21 while while you were at WashU. And um, I remember seeing it on Facebook and I was like, what? How did she even get there? So could we talk a little bit about that experience? Like this is going to sound very cliche, but so much of life is just about putting yourself out there and like being clear about what you love. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of the right people fall into the right places at the right time. So for me, I did the interdisciplinary environmental law clinic and and I'm just like a really friendly person. So I talked to all kinds of people. And so in the clinic there, we worked with lawyers, but we also worked with environmental professionals, like environmental engineers, um, because it was an interdisciplinary clinic. And so part of the people who were in the clinic were in the law school. And then part of the people were in like undergrad or in other graduate degrees. On my team, we had one lawyer and one environmental engineer, but the environmental engineer who is on our team, um, you know, he's kind of like a faculty advisor. His office was right next to a different office. Um, And so I got to know the woman in that office well too, because I, you know, be wanting to talk to my advisor, but you know, he'd be talking to somebody else. So I just like strike up a conversation with this other woman and her name was Beth. And so I got to know her a little bit. Um, and then I was also involved in the, one of the first things I did when I got to WashU was I 
like emailed the environmental energy and environmental law society president. And I was like, I would like to be involved in your club. How can I help? What can I do? Let me know. And so I got to know the president well, um, and she had gone to cop the year before and she was, and so, you know, just in kind of talking to her, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I love the, um, international environmental political scene. And I, I find it so interesting. And so when it came time to recruit the people for cop, she called me up and she was like, Hey, you know, that environmental engineer, Beth, she runs the students who go to cop and she knows you well because she's, you know, worked with you in the clinic. Would you be interested in going to cop? I think you'd really like it. I'm going to put my name down for you. And I know that she'd be really interested in having you too. And so it was kind of just like a perfect kind of storm of stuff. Like I would have never heard about it because I was the only law student who went, the rest of the students were undergrad. Technically I was taking an undergrad class to go. Mm. I kind of just ended up knowing the right people. And somebody was like, Hey, this is stuff that you talk about loving all the time. Why don't you apply to go? And so I did. And so I just, I happened to be at the right school, which is, I mean, it's in the Midwest. It's like, you wouldn't necessarily guess that a school from the Midwest is one of the few that sends right. environmental students every single year. And so it was kind of serendipitous, to be honest. Um, and that, again, that sounds so cliche, but I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And like, I always made my passion really clear. And so when kind of opportunities come up, people were like, oh, Elise loves that. We should tell her about it. And then always applying. Like I've, I've received so many rejections in my life, but every now and then I get really cool acceptances. And so, um, and this, this was certainly one of them. Yeah. So I took a class and we tracked the agreement starting from the beginning of the semester. I think we actually, we, it was for obviously for the fall of 2016. Was it fall of 2016? 2015? Mm, 2015, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And so we just, we tracked the agreement. Um, and so at the beginning we were kind of just divvying up sections and I was like, I mean, you know, let me take the finance section. And because nobody was like, everybody was, because I was in a class of kind of like <laughs> typical environmentalists, they were like, I want to talk about mitigation. I want to talk about, you know, adaptation. Of course there was a huge mitigation versus adaptation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, discussion. Um, and that's kind of, you're kind of, a lot of people find themselves in one camp or the other. Um, a lot of people wanted kind of the more traditional ones. And I was like, well, let's talk, I'll take finance. And people were like, why do you want the finance section? That's going to be so boring. And then it ended up, and I loved it. Um, because to me, I love that kind of like, roll your hands up, you know, or roll your sleeves up, roll your hands up, roll your <laughs> sleeves up, <laughs> roll your, do not roll your hands up, um, roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty like where the rubber meets the road, like I really like to be kind of like in there. And so to me, that was, that's really what finance is. It's like, you can have all these great ideas, but it's when the money meets the ideas. That's when stuff gets happening. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why I was really kind of drawn to the finance section initially. And so as I was, you know, learning about all of that and tracking it. And so weekly, we'd have to do these reports to the whole class. But at the end of every single week, people inevitably would be like, this is a really great um, section, but it all depends on what Elisa's finance section really says at the end. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is why finance is so key. Because you can't, unfortunately, you can't do a whole lot without moving the money first. And so I was like, finance, this is it. And so it was, it was, it was really, really cool. I mean, what an amazing experience to oh my gosh. be able to go. I mean, I can, I can only imagine, but I, I think it's so true when you make what you're passionate about so clear and you make Absolutely. it clear to yourself, but you also make it clear to others. I think yeah. those opportunities start to show up and they start to really, um, present themselves. And I think for you, you've always really followed the things that you love and, and mm -hmm. the environment and figuring out your role in it and how you could make a difference mm -hmm. moving forward. I mean, where do you see yourself in the environmental movement? So I definitely certainly see myself in the environmental, like certainly in the finance realm. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's something that I just honestly keep coming back to when I think, when I think about stuff that I genuinely enjoy, um, it's always kind of in the finance stuff because it's a little bit of law. And what I also love about it is that it changes so often. So you're involved in policy too, and kind of tracking all of that. And so that's really interesting. Um, but then you also like, you're not going to make an investment decision if the business deal isn't sound or, you know, when that's true, whether you're picking stocks or you're picking bonds or what, whatever it is, there has to be a sound investment decision in there. And of course there's tons of math involved. And I was the only student in law school who loved math. I was um, going to say, we, we go to law school expecting not to do any math. 
Um, yeah, so you're kind exactly. of the, the uh, anomaly here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So then I got to business school and they were like, okay, we need you to run all these regressions and do all sorts of Excel work. And I was like, oh, math. I love math. Cool. Let's do that. <laughs> I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, so I see myself certainly in, in the finance world. And to be honest with you right now, I'm really trying to figure out what part of the finance world I best yeah. fit in. My inkling is kind of private equity. I think that there's there's opportunities across the board. And I'm to be honest with you, I'm still trying to figure out where my skill set best fits. Um, because I think some of it's definitely a personality fit too. So the answer is TBD, um, but mm-hmm. certainly in the finance space. But we'll kind of see. I think I, one thing that I learned and kind of committed to myself, I saw, I'm sure I saw this on Pinterest and that was probably not a good reason to commit <laughs> myself to it, but, um, but I, it just really resonated with me. And that was be firm about your goals, flexible about the path oh, or yeah, something that's a along good one. those lines. Yeah. And so it was, you know, I'm committed to having an impact on the environment, but how I do that and being open to kind of the path that arises, I think has been really kind of freeing for me. Yeah, I totally. think that in, you know, in the near future, we're going to see a huge change in how the environment is valued and how environmental impact is valued and, and all of that. And so I think that the opportunities available for having that impact and change are going to change a lot. And so uh, that's also why... I kind of want to keep my scope open and not kind of narrow myself down so much because I think that the the landscape's really going to change in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Oh yeah, no, totally. I think it goes back again to, you know, knowing what it is you're passionate about, but Mm -hmm. remaining sort of flexible about what that journey is going to look like Mm -hmm. for you. Because I also think it's totally normal and really okay to not know exactly where you fit in right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Kind of going back to what we were talking about before with um, staying balanced and joy and that whole mm-hmm. aspect of our conversation, where where do you feel most like yourself? So I feel like when there are kind of like three things where I feel most like myself. One is when I'm surrounded by like the people who recharge mm-hmm. me. You know, I think there you know there are several different types of people in this world. You know, there are the people who you know you enjoy being around. You're like, oh, this is nice. There are people who you're like, you are just too much. Like you're absolutely draining. I do not enjoy being around you. And then there are those people who I just like absolutely light up your soul. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've been very lucky in that. Like I really just ended up surrounding myself with a bunch of people who really just light up my soul. And so I feel like I feel most myself when I'm around those people or when I'm getting to solve environmental problems, even if it's just kind of like theoretically, I feel like getting kind of like my hands kind of dirty in that thought process is I just, I totally feel alive or also probably out on like a hiking trail. I love being out in the fresh air and in the nature, specifically if I'm up at like kind of like a high altitude and there's a bunch of like pine trees. I'm like just like such a happy Mm. camper. And but yeah, so I'd say around my favorite people solving environmental problems or, you know, kind of like out in the environment. I feel like that's really when I feel like I'm being the best version of myself. Yeah. I think uh, it's so important to surround yourself with people who, who really get you and who sort of contribute, Absolutely. contribute positively to, to you and your journey. And you can sort of do the same thing too. Mm-hmm. And I love what you said about lighting up your soul because yeah. you want, you want to be around people in situations and environments where you feel, you feel that recharge, you feel that charge, yeah. you feel mm-hmm. lit up in that way. And I think it inspires you to do more. And so I just, I loved that phrase that you used. I think it it's so perfect. Oh, absolutely. So taking it back to joy, is there a certain mindset or something that you practice that really helps you to find and, and cultivate more joy in your life? Things that um, that I do on a daily basis to really find and cultivate joy um, is really to have gratitude um, and making the effort um, you know, to see, to like, to be grateful about kind of everything, whether it's big or small, um, and to have gratitude for, um, as our Alpha Chi Omega Symphony says, um, (laughs) you know, kind of everything and the beauty in everything and making an effort to see the beauty, even in the small things. And so I found that really kind of that mindset brings me so much joy. And whenever I find myself kind of like 
thinking negative negatively, like, oh man, this traffic's so bad, or you know, oh, I can't believe we have another delay on the BART train. Like, uh, I'm like, okay, you know what? I have my Kindle. I get to read this book that I've been wanting to read. And kind of like whenever I have like a negative thought to instead kind of like re- require myself, I guess, to counteract yeah. it with kind of like a positive gratitude thought, um, even if, and even if it's just something super small, I find that it makes such a big difference. And, and I remember reading somewhere or somebody told me at some point that, you know, if you um, like, I guess there was a study done. And if you think of like three things you're grateful for right before a test, um, like on, on average students do better, um, if they've like studied the same and everything. And so that gratitude just kind of, I guess, like gives your brain like a little boost. And so I, I find a lot of joy in that. And so, um, yeah, so I'd really try and do that and it's really small and really simple and, Yeah. And so that's just something I also do to kind of cultivate joy in my everyday life. Yeah. I think reminding yourself of what you're grateful for. I've seen that too, where they talk about, you know, last, the first thing you do when you wake up is to write down like a couple of things you're grateful for. And then also doing it right before you go to bed, because it's a good way to sort of, I guess for lack of a better word, but prime your mindset and get yourself into that space of gratitude. And, um, I love that you do that. And I love how you tied it back to the Alpha Chi symphony, symphony, which is something I've totally forgotten about, but, um, yeah, that's, that's such a great way to put it and reminding yourself of the little things, you know, that that there's so much joy in even the little things too. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of times I get really, I personally get really caught up in, um, you know, striving for big goals and big things and, and, that's not the only thing that, you know, can bring us joy, like little tiny things bring joy too. Um, and so I think I, I try and make an effort kind of every day to, uh, to appreciate those as well. Yeah. I love that. So what would you say is your biggest dream? I know we talked about the kind of impact you want to have, but what would you say is, is kind of up there on the list? I want to be able to, when I look back on my life, think that, you know, that I made at least a few people happier, a, a few people healthier and that the world is just a little bit better because mm-hmm. I was here. Like I have kind of just like an internal goal of making like some one person smile every day. And so I think just leaving the world a little bit happier and healthier. And uh, and to me, I think that a healthy environment is like critical to human beings being mm-hmm. healthier. Um, and so that's, I think that's kind of the root of why I pick the environment or why the environment kind of resonated with me. Um, so I have like kind of like a life bucket list. Yeah. So, and that, that includes like, I would love to be able to speak Italian and French and Spanish all fluently. Um, you know, I'd love to step foot on every single continent. You know, I have like a running list of all the places that I want to go. Um, you know, I'd love to compete in a ballroom dance competition and I'd love to open up uh, like a bakery or a, like a stationary store. That's like all of that focused in like, you know, environmental stuff. So like, you know, or only organic foods and then obviously like, you know, eco-friendly stationary because I love stationary and it is hard to find cute Mm-hmm. And envi- like environmentally friendly stationary. Um, it's very hard to do that. Um, and then, but just also really have, have an impact. And so, you know, I thought about like starting a blog or something like that. I'm kind of like in the, in the thought process of, of starting, starting something like that, just to be able to reach people and have, have that kind of positive impact. I think, yeah, yeah really just, I like, I'm a, I'm a people person at my core And so spending as much time enjoying the society of a bunch of other people, um, I think that that's kind of what kind of like my big dream is too. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for kind of having a life bucket list like that. And I love how it's so diverse. And I think that also just goes to show that there are so many different paths that we can all take. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. you may start out doing one thing, but you may lead you to opening up that bakery or uh, that, you know, that stationary store, or it may lead you to spending a year traveling the world. I mean, you have no idea, but I, I think, you know, we never know where we're going to end up. You may start one place and uh, it can totally lead you somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me having like, the, like I have a couple lists. So I have like a, this is what I want to accomplish in the next, you know, couple years. And I don't know if you've heard of like 101 in 1001 lists. No. So it's like 101 things that you want to do in a, in a thousand and one days. One of the like bloggers that I follow, her name is Design Darling, or I think that was her store, her like online store name. I think her, her name is Mackenzie Horan. 
And I think, and so I think her website's like MackenzieHorn.com. But, um, and so she's how I found out about it. Um, and I, but I guess it's like a whole kind of group of people who like, you know, set out and say, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm necessarily going to do all 101 things in a thousand and one days, but this is what I'd really like to do in the next 1001 days, which is, I think it's like 2.75 years. Oh, wow. Just, and yeah, so it's like, right. it's, you know, it's not like a huge amount of time. It's not like in the next 10 years, but it's not like it has less of a pressure than in the next year. Cause years, years, at least for me have started to fly by and I'm like, I can't get all uh, that accomplished Yeah, this year alone has like oh, flown. Oh my gosh. Flown. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But then, you know, it's also like, I have that life bucket list and I'm like, this will happen ideally at some point in my life. But it doesn't have to be tomorrow. It doesn't have to be in the next few years. Like I, I, like I, for me, I find a lot of comfort in being like, one day I will do those things, but not get putting the pressure on myself to like do all of the things in mm -hmm. the next like 15 years or something. Um, and so I found that that's very comforting to me. Again, as a planner, I'm like, you know, plan at the right time, plan to do things at the right time. So yeah, and that makes a lot of sense too. So for anyone who's listening, I guess, to this podcast, and I love your story, I feel like you have done so much and have accomplished so much, and you're only Thank getting you. started. And um, that was in part why we were so excited to have you on the podcast, because I think you are so passionate and so motivated. And I think so many people could relate and be inspired to by your story. And so oh, thank for, you. for anyone that's listening and maybe they want to have an impact on the world or mm -hmm. take risks or put themselves out there in the ways that you have, what would be your biggest piece of advice? So I have kind of two pieces of advice. So the first is to get clear on what you do and do not like. So, and it, and like, it's totally fine. Like, I feel like I've talked to several of my friends who are, you know, in their mid twenties or late twenties. And they're like, Elise, I feel like I've just been kind of running the hamster wheel and just like been, I've been doing what I've been supposed to be doing for so many years that I have no idea what I do want to be doing. And so I've been like, you know, take the time right now, w you know, I mean, whether you're 15, whether you're 25, you know, whether you're 55, it doesn't matter. Take the time to get clear on what you do and do not like. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so I read a book recently, which I, I feel like I'm talking about a million books that I, I, I really like to read books, obviously <laughs> it's called the sleep revolution by Ariana Huffington. And then I, and I, in tandem with that, I read another book called the weekend effect by, I think it's Karina or Katrina Onstad. And, um, and they both kind of talked about this, which is that we don't build enough time in our days to just be bored. So much creativity and so much I feel like of what our minds are truly curious about and what lights us up is born out of boredom. And both of those books talk about that too. So I know for me, when I'm the most bored is when I, it's the time on an airplane when they tell you you have to shut your phone off, but you're sitting on the tarmac and like nothing's going by. So like, there's nothing to look at. You're just staring at the, the tarmac and, and you're just like, I'm, I'm dead bored right now. Like I can't have my phone on. And like, what am I supposed to do? And my, I felt like my mind always just gets so creative in that time. I, in college, I used to drive a lot from LA back home to San Francisco. And that drive is so boring, but I used to do it often purely because it was a time when I would just turn the music off and I just let my mind go. And I mean, obviously pay attention to the road, but, um, right. <laughs> very important. Pay attention to numero uno, pay attention to the road, but giving yourself the downtime to let yourself be bored and see where your mind goes. I, f I feel like that's, that's really how I've kind of followed my passion is that I give my mind that kind of like free time to be like, okay, what are you interested in? And so, so I would, I would say in order to get clear on what you do and do not like, let yourself be bored and watch to see where your mind goes and kind of take inventory on that. And I find it helpful to like write it down in a journal. And I, I was terrible about keeping a journal for the longest time. And my sister at one point was like, during one of kind of like my burnout periods, she was like, just write everything that you're angry about in your journal and just like get it out on paper. And then once you write it down, just be like, I'm done. And, but it also was, it was also a good kind of point where I'd write stuff down and I'd realize like I was writing about certain things that was, that were in my mind over and over and over again. And, and it also writing helped me gain clarity, but it also made me realize like, wow, this stuff is really taking up a lot of my brain space. Like maybe I need to dedicate a little more energy to this. So I would say that 
and follow your curiosity. And I feel like a long time ago, I decided that I was going to define the type of person that I wanted to be and that I wasn't going to follow somebody else's ideal. And again, this is just me being like an internal rebel, but that I was going to define the type of person that I wanted to be and the kind of life that I wanted to lead. And if somebody else had a problem with that, then like that was their issue. And so decide what kind of person you want to be and how, what you want your life to look like. And then from that, use what you do and do not like in order to create that person that you want to be. And then the last piece of advice, I would say take the the kind of very scary risk to talk to somebody who's in that field and get a really good sense of what their day to day looks like. Mm -hmm. I know that before, like before I decided to go to law school, I knew a certain set of lawyers that did kind of like one type of law. And I was like, I feel like I have a really good idea of what every single lawyer does based on that. And that is like, so not true. Um, <laughs> lawyers do all sorts of different things and lead all sorts of different lives getting and and I feel like law is a good example. And I feel like you certainly know this that like, being a lawyer is not a career, it's a lifestyle. And so I feel like understanding what the lifestyle is of an industry that you're thinking about going into and really getting clear on that so that you can make a really informed decision. Like this is something that I want to do. This is something that I don't want to do. Oh yeah, totally. And so I would, I would say just to kind of try stuff and to kind of get a whole idea or a really a realistic idea of what it would look like to go do something like that. And it's Mm -hmm. totally fine to, to try something and be like, I like this. I don't love it. What's my next option? And because everything is a data point. And so you just continue to use data points. Like, for example, like I said, I, I worked in lobbying and I, I loved certain aspects of lobbying, which was that as a lobbyist, you're rarely sitting behind a desk all day. You are out like talking to people. I was like, oh my gosh, this is super cool. I don't necessarily want to do this for the rest of my life, but I really like this aspect of it. And so I definitely certainly want a career where I need to be talking to people all the time and I need to be kind of like following like updates all the time. And I feel like that part has certainly led very much into kind of the work that I do now where I, I certainly am talking to people all the time um, and I do need to continuously follow yeah. updates. And so I feel like every single data point that you get is whether you say, I do like this or I don't like this. It's so helpful. Yeah, no, I think that's all, that's all really, really good pieces of advice, getting clear on who you want to be and what you're passionate about and, Mm -hmm. and reaching out to the right people. I think that's all, that's all super important to do. I think, uh, really good advice. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I think your story and your journey and everything you had to share, I think, um, I don't know, I think a lot of people will be inspired by and and can totally relate to. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for including me. I'm like so honored. Yeah, totally. Your podcast came out and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. And like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh.